Thank you for coming, everyone. This talk will be interactive, and we begin with clock arithmetic. Let's say now it's two o'clock. Where is the hand of the clock going to point after 13 hours? Yes? At three, absolutely. In 13 hours, if you add 13 hours, it has the same effect as adding just one hour. Adding 12 hours is not doing anything. We record this by writing 2 plus 13 is congruent to 3 modulo 12. That's what it means. In the clock arithmetic, 2 plus 13 is the same as 3. What if now it's 9 o'clock? In 51 hours, where is the hand going to point? Yes? At 0. Yes, you can say 12. 12 is the same as 0. It will point at 0. After 48 hours, it will again point at 9. And then 3 more, it goes back to 0. We write 9 plus 51 congruent to 0 mod 12. This notation is ingenious. Now, you can not only add, you can subtract. If, it's, if now the hand points at 7, where was it pointing? 26 hours ago. Yes, at 5, absolutely. At 5, 24 hours ago it was again 7. To subtract 2 more, you get to 5. Now, congruent to 5, mod 12. Now, for us, 16 is the same as 4 mod 12. If you want, you can talk about 16. If you don't like 16, you just replace it by 4. 16 gives residue 4 upon division by 12. If, if you start at 0, in 16 hours, the hand will point at 4 o'clock. Now, the good news, if you don't like big numbers, well, if you, let's say 131 is uncomfortably big for you. Well, then it's congruent to, to 11. Absolutely, because 120 is divisible by 12, and you need 11 more. This is the residue of 131 upon division by 12. Now, if you want to add numbers, 20 plus 30. You can add it the usual way. You can add them the usual way. You can get 50. Absolutely correct. There is no doubt about this. But then this 50 is congruent to, to 2 mod 12, because 48 is divisible by 12. But if you don't like adding big numbers, let's say these were, imagine these were maybe not 20 and 30, but really big numbers. If you don't like addition of big numbers, you can first say that 20 is congruent to 8 modulo 12 because it's 12 plus 8. 30 is congruent to 6. And rather than add 20 and 30, which will give you a big number, and then you can do it mod 12, you can reduce each of them mod 12, get 8 and 6. Add those, you get 14. And 14 is, of course, congruent to 2 modulo 12. This is much easier than the usual arithmetic. This is called clock arithmetic. Much easier. You don't need big numbers, you can subtract, everything you can do very easily. The goal of this talk is to convince you, so far I've convinced you that this is easy. The goal is to convince you that this is also useful. If you are interested in the usual arithmetic, the usual integers, and this will help. Now, for our purposes, we'll be looking at the clock with only four divisions. We'll be working mod four. Mod four, well, it's just you're not so used to this clock, but it's equally easy. What is 18 mod 4? Yes? 2, absolutely, because 16 is divisible by 4. If you have 18 francs and you want to buy cakes, each cake costs 4. You buy as many as possible, and then you're left with 2 francs. This is the re remainder. Minus 11, if you don't like negative numbers, minus 11 is congruent to, yes? 1, absolutely, to 1 mod 4. You can add 7 plus 20. What is 7 plus 20? Yes? Say again. 1. Yes? It's 3, because 27 is 24 plus 3. Okay. Now... Now let's do an experiment. Choose an integer among 1 to up to 12. Choose it randomly and remember it. Don't change your mind later. Remember it. So you chose an integer. Now, 
compute what this integer is congruent to mod 4. Compute its remainder upon division by 4. Where does it fall in our clock with 4 divisions? If you chose a smaller number, maybe you're lucky. If you chose a larger number, not a big deal. Compute what it's congruent to. Raise your hand if you got 0. If your number is a lot of you. OK. Raise your hand if you got a 1. Again, plenty. Raise your hand if you got a 2, if your number is congruent to 2. Fair number again. And raise your hand if you got a 3. Again, roughly the same numbers. Right. So these are the possible integers that you could have chosen. 1, 2, 3, up to 12. Let's look at their remainders. As you walk along the number line, jumping from one integer to the other integer, you wrap around this circle. So let's say you start at 1, and then or 0, or 1, doesn't matter, and you walk along the integer line, jumping from integer to integer, the, re the residues will go 1, 2, 3, and then 0, and then again 1, 2, 3, 0, and so on. That's why about a quarter of you had a 0, a quarter of you had a 1, quarter had a 2, quarter had a 3, because these residues are equally likely to appear. Now, you remember the number you chose. Compute its square. Square it. If you chose a smaller number, you're lucky, but not a big deal if you chose 11 or 12. Compute the square. And then what is the square congruent to mod 4? Compute the residue of the square of your number upon division by 4. Shouldn't be difficult to compute. Now, raise your hand if you got a 0. OK, so I'm not going to count, but plenty of you. Raise your hand if you got a 1. Again, plenty. Raise your hand if you got a 2. Nobody. Uh, there seems to be a bias. Did you really choose the numbers randomly? Raise your hand if you got a 3. <laughs> Only one person. All right, so look, let's try to explain this. Look at these integers from 1 through 12. You computed their squares. These are the squares, 1, 4, 9, 16, and so on. Hopefully, the square that you computed was among those. Now, let's look at their remainders when we divide by 4. Let's see what happens when we divide by 4. Compute x squared mod 4. What is 1 mod 4? 1. How about 4? 0. 9? 1. 16? Divisible by 4. 25? It's 24 plus 1. It's 1. 36? Divisible by 4. 49 is 48 plus 1. 1. And so on. What do you notice? It's only zeros and ones. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. They alternate between zeros and ones. That's why nobody had a two and someone by mistake had a three. But otherwise, otherwise, you should have only gotten zeros or ones. Half of you had zeros, half of you roughly had ones. Let's prove it. Let's prove that for any integer. Any integer that you pick, not necessarily between one and twelve. The square is either 0 or 1 mod 4. Never 2, never 3. How do you prove it? Let's prove it. Yes? Absolutely, absolutely. Take an even number. An even number has the form 2 times k. When you square it, so you have to take 2k squared, it's 4 times k squared. Now, read this off. What is this saying? It's 4 times something. It's 4 times something. It's divisible by 4. It's congruent to 0 mod 4. That's what it means. It's 4 times something. And now, as you suggest, let's also take an odd number. An odd number can be written as 2k plus 1. That's what an odd number is. Take the square of an odd number, 2k plus 1 square. How do you expand this? What is the formula? Yes? No, 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 no. Say again. 4k squared plus? Absolutely. 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. Now let's read this formula. It's 4 times something plus 1. 
So it's a multiple of four plus one. When you, fi when you try to find its place in, a, in your clock, you have a multiple of four, which brings you back to zero, and then one. It's congruent to one mod four. That's why even squares give you zero, and the squares of odd integers give you one. Here is our statement for an integer x. Capital Z denotes the set of integers, ganze Zahlen, zero plus minus one plus minus two. X square is zero or one mod four, depending on the parity of X. If X is even, you get zero. If X is odd, you get one. And never two or three mod four. Two and three are in red. They're forbidden residues. Zero and one are allowed. Okay. Now, of course, not every number congruent to zero or one is a square. Five is congruent to one. It's not a square. But if you have a square, it must be zero or one. Now, we'll look at some applications of this. How about this? Find all positive integers n. Positive integers means n is 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Such that this number, 2 to the power of n plus 23, is a perfect square. How can 2 to the n plus 23 be a perfect square? When is 2 to the n plus 23 a perfect square? And let's say n is a positive integer. So you start at 1. n is at least 1. Yes? 2 to the 1. Absolutely. So let's compute some values for various n's. We compute 2 to the n plus 23. When n is 1, you get 25. So uh, you get a perfect square. When n is 2, 2 squared plus 23 is 27. Not a perfect square. When n is 3, 8 plus 23, 31, not a perfect square. 16 plus 23, not a perfect square. 32 plus 23 is 55, and so on, 87. We don't seem to get more perfect squares, at least so far. But maybe when n is 1,507,011, maybe then you get a perfect square. You have to find all integers for which this is a perfect square. So far, we have n equals 1. Check. Are there others? That's the question. Are there other integers? So that this quantity becomes a perfect square. What do you think? Are there other integers? If you think there are other integers, you should be able to point at such. You should say, well, look at this value of n. Manifestly, this is a perfect square. If you think there are no such other integers, we have to prove it, yes? n equals 13. So 2 to the 13 plus 23, you say it's a perfect square. Mm. In fact, it will not be a perfect square. It will not be a perfect square. Yes? Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. So let's look mod 4. Let's look at this mod 4. One way, we are going to prove that this number is never a perfect square when n is bigger than 1. It's a perfect square only when n is equal to 1. As long as n becomes at least 2, there is an obstruction. This number cannot become a perfect square. Now you're proposing, look at it mod 4. Let's look at these numbers, look at the values that we have. Mod 4, what are they? Mod 4, 25 is congruent to 1. That's 24 plus 1. 27 is congruent to? 27 is congruent to 3. It's 24 plus 3. What about 31? Congruent to? 3 again. 39? 3 again. You only see 3s. And remember, a square cannot be congruent to 3 mod 4. So now, let's prove. Let's prove that as long as n is at least 2, this number, the way you prove that it cannot be a square, is you're going to prove that it's going, it's, it will be congruent to 3 mod 4. 
that will make it not be a square. It cannot be a square. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, as you're proposing, if n is at least 2, look at 2 to the n plus 23 mod 4. What can you say about the first summand? 2 to the n. Yes? It will be 0 mod 4. Absolutely, because n is at least 2. You have at least 2 factors of 2. 2 times 2, maybe times more copies of 2. But it the first summand is definitely divisible by 4. It's congruent to 0 mod 4. What about 23? 23 is always congruent to 3 mod 4. So you always get 0 plus 3, which gives you 3 mod 4. This is a forbidden residue, forbidden remainder. That number cannot be a square. 2 to the n plus 23 cannot be a perfect square when n is at least 2. That's why n equals 1 is the only solution. Look, if you don't look at clock arithmetic mod 4, how would you prove that n equals 1 is the only solution? Here is an app, this is an application of mod 4 clock arithmetic. Show that this is a perfect square only when n is equal to 1. Okay, now let's look at this example. Can you find integers x and y such that this complicated expression that you see, the sum of the two squares of the two brackets, so that this complicated expression is a perfect square? Is it possible that this is a perfect square? Now, Can this become a perfect square? I know what some of you are thinking about. You're trying out some values. So let me save you some work. Here are some values of this complicated expression. When x and y are both zeros, you get 1 plus 1, 2. When x is 0, y is 1, you get 1 square plus 3 square, you get 10. When x is 2, y is 3, you get 218, and so on. These are some values. This is your data. Look at the data now. Do you recognize, by the way, in this table a perfect square? No, none of these is a perfect square. What is your hypothesis now? Is it possible that this expression becomes a perfect square ever? No, absolutely no. Now, prove. Prove that this expression is never a perfect square, yes? Aha, all of these numbers that you see in the table, all of these numbers are congruent to 2 mod 4, and 2 mod 4, a number which is 2 mod 4, cannot be a perfect square. Look, 2 is 2. 10 is congruent to 2 mod 4. 50 is 48 plus 2. 170 is 168 plus 2. All of these numbers are congruent to 2 mod 4. Now you're saying that this expression is always, always congruent to 2 mod 4, no matter how you choose the x and y. That will be 2 mod 4, and that that means that it has no chance to be a perfect square. Why? Why is this expression always congruent to 2 mod 4? Yes? Aha, I see. Yes, 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 yes. So each bracket, the term in each bracket is an odd number. Look! It's not just sum of two squares. Sum of two squares, in principle, the sum of two squares can be a square. For example, 3 squared plus 4 squared, as you all know, 9 plus 16, 25, is a perfect square. You can have a square plus a square being a square. But you cannot have the sum of two odd squares to become a square. Look, x squared plus x plus 1, this is always an odd integer. No matter how you choose x, no matter if x is even or odd, this will be odd. Because look, one way is you write it as x times x plus 1 plus 1. 
x and x plus 1 are two consecutive positive integers, one of them is necessarily even. Therefore, x times x plus 1 is even. When you add 1, you get something odd. Therefore, inside the brackets, each term is an odd integer. And now you can write that your expression, the sum of these two squares, is congruent to. Each of them is an odd. And the square of an odd integer is congruent to 1 mod 4. So it's 1 plus 1, as you proposed. It's always congruent to 2 mod 4. 2 is a forbidden residue of a, of a square. A square cannot be 2 mod 4. No matter how you try. And look, the solution is so simple. Basically, the solution doesn't make use of this table. The solution consists of only two lines. Each expression within the brackets is odd, and then the whole thing is congruent to 2 mod 4, cannot be a perfect square. You see how elegant the proof becomes once you appropriately use mod 4 arithmetic. Excellent. Now, that cannot be a perfect square. Now, finally, let's look at that equation. Find all positive integers x, y, and z. These are your three unknowns, x, y, and z, which satisfy this equation. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 2 times x, y, z. Find all positive integers which are related by this equation. Now, this kind of equation is very different from the equations that you do in school. In school, you usually have one equation in one variable. You have only x and some other numbers. And then you have to rearrange and express x, so you have to find x. Or, depending on what you do in school, you may have two equations with two variables, x and y. 5x plus 3y equals something, x plus 20y equals something else. Then maybe you express x from the first equation, plug it in in the second equation, then you have one equation for one variable, and so on. Here you have one single equation in three variables. However, the variables are integers. There are instances when you can solve such an equation. One equation in three variables, you can solve it in integers. In this case, we'll be able to completely solve that kind of equation. Find all integers which are related in this way. Some of their squares is twice their product. Does a solution come to mind? You have so much freedom, you have three variables. The problem is, if you just plug in values of y and z, if you try y to be 5 and z to be 30, and if you get an equation for x, it's very unlikely that it will have a solution in integers. It will have a solution, but not in integers necessarily. Because the discriminant, the discriminant would have to be a perfect square and uh, the discriminant is unlikely to be a perfect square if you plugged in random values for y and z. Now, let's start analyzing. By the way, maybe there are no solutions. Solve the equation means determine if there are solutions and if there are, list all of them. It could be that there are no solutions. What can you say? Look at that equation. What are some preliminary observations? Yes? All variables? All variables have to be even. Excellent, excellent, excellent. That will unlock the whole equation. Now, what do you want to say? The same? Absolutely. Now, look. On the right-hand side, you have an even quantity. 
two times something. If you have a solution, then the right-hand side is even. Therefore, the left-hand side also has to be even. Now, just think about even and odd for now. Just think about even and odd. The right-hand side is manifestly even, therefore the left-hand side also has to be even. How, how can the left-hand side be even? What are the circumstances under which the left-hand side is even? Yes? Absolutely. Either one is even and two odd, or all three of them are even. That's the only possibility. You cannot have two even and one odd, then the left-hand side would be odd, and you cannot have three odd quantities on the left-hand side, then the left-hand side would be odd. As you say, there are only two cases. Either they are all even, case two, or one of them is even and two of them are odd. That's it. These are the only two cases. However, you proposed that, in fact, x, y, and z all have to be even. All of them must be even. He's saying that the first case does not take place. My question is, can you indeed rule out case one? Can you rule out case one? What is wrong in case one? Is it not possible that one of them is even and two of them are odd? One even and two odd will perfectly well give me an even quantity on the left. Can you rule out case one? Yes? Mm, the left hand side would be if you have two of them odd and one even. Two. The left-hand side would be two mod four. And what about the right-hand side? It would be? Yes? Zero. Absolutely. Suppose that you're in case one. We're going to rule out case one. Now, before we launch into this, let me say, thinking about even and odd. This is very useful. You can get your hands on the numbers. You know that it's either one of, it's one of those two cases. Looking at the equation mod four, it's like zooming in. You're looking with um, you're looking at it in a finer way. You know, in our clock we have 12 divisions, but we really use a 24-hour clock because it could be 2 a.m., it could be 2 p.m. If you only use 12 divisions, you cannot tell apart 2 a.m. from 2 p.m. If you use 24 divisions, then 2 a.m. and 2 p.m. are different. Now, if you look only even and odd. Well, both cases are possible. But if you look mod 4, if you go one level deeper, if you look mod 4, then case 1 is not possible because suppose you're in case 1. Suppose case 1 is taking place. You have one even and two odd. What about the right-hand side? Two times the two stays there. One of the numbers is even and two of them are odd. So it's 2 times even times odd times odd. What happens when you multiply 2 times an even number? Yes? It's still even. Yes, if you stick with even, even and odd, if you distinguish even and odd, that's very nice, then you will say, well, the right-hand side will be even and the left-hand side will be even and you cannot rule out the case. You're not looking, you have to zoom in a little bit. Zooming in means you look not only even odd, you look mod 4. Yes? It's 0 mod 4. When I multiply 2 times an even number, we get 0 mod 4. Look, if you think mod 4, then you can approach the problem. If you only think even and odd, the problem becomes very difficult. Now, the right-hand side is 0, and as you say, the left-hand side is 1 square is even and 2 odd. If you only look at it from the even-odd perspective, well, you would say this is 1 even and 2 odd, it will be even. But think about it mod 4, yes? It's 2 because mm, even square is 0 and the 2 odd squares contribute, each of them contributes a 1. So the left-hand side becomes a 2 mod 4. They're indistinguishable from a mod 2 perspective. They're both even. But mod 4, 
you see that one would be two, the other would be zero, they cannot agree mod four. Therefore, the left-hand side and right-hand side cannot agree because they cannot agree mod four. Absolutely. This is an application of the mod four arithmetic. Now, therefore, we are actually in case two. Case two must be taking place. All of them must be even. This is a significant step. This is the heart of the proof. Now, let's see. What does it mean that they are all even? Yes? When they are all even, the left-hand side will be 0 mod 4. Absolutely. And the right-hand side, what can you say about the right-hand side? Two times and then a bunch of, and then three even numbers, the right-hand side will also be 0 mod 4. So it seems like case two is possible. Now, let's continue the argument. I claim you can prove that this equation actually has no solutions. No solutions. If you take a solution, there, is a, there are these two cases, case one or case two. Case one, we ruled out. What about case two? What if there is a solution and they're all even? Yes? You can continue looking at it mod 8. Yes, you can continue looking at it mod 8. That's one way. Or, you know, when they're all even, let's write them as 2 times something, 2 times something, and 2, and two times something. This is how we articulate mathematically that the three numbers are even. Each of them is two times another integer. That's what an even number is. And then we cancel, and then we'll look again, even and odd. If you want, you can look at it mod 4, but it's nicer if you just cancel common factors. We know that they're even, and it's really helpful to actually spell this out. That's how you spell out that the three numbers are even. Now, from x, y, and z, we obtain x1, y1, z1. x, y, and z give rise to x1, y1, z1. Now, plug in x, y, and z in the equation. Plug them in. Let's see what we have. Now, we're going to forget about x, y, z. We want to go to x1, y1, and z1. x, y, z, they give rise to x1, y1, z1. Now, let's focus on x1, y1, z1. The equation becomes like this when you replace x, y, and z by 2x1, 2y1, 2z1. I don't want to worry anymore about x, y, z. Now we focus on x1, y1, z1. Now this equation, should we keep it like this or should we cancel something? What do we cancel? Yes? A 4. On the left-hand side there is a 4. On the right-hand side there is a 4. And then two more copies of 2. Once we cancel 4, on the left, you have the sum of the squares, and on the right, you have four times their product. It's like this. Okay, so if you start with x, y, z being solutions, a solution of the initial equation, they give rise to x1, y1, z1, which are solutions of that equation. What can you say next? What can you say next? Now focus on x1, y1, z1. What can you say about x1, y1, z1? Yes? Again, they all have to be even, absolutely, because, again, the right-hand side is even. Again, it's not possible that 1 is even and 2 are odd, because then the left-hand side would be, if it would be 2 mod 4, but the right-hand side is manifestly divisible by 4. There is a factor of 4 out there. Therefore, again... They're all even. Again, they're even. Now, how do you articulate that they're all even? You write them as 2x2, 2y2, 2z2. That's what an even number is. It's two times some other integer. In this case, they're positive integers, so each of them is two times another positive integer. Now, we started with x, y, z. Then we figured something about x1, y1, z1. Now, x1, y1, z1, we represent them in terms of x2, y2, and z2. 
What can you say about x2, y2, and z2? They're not just random. They come from x1, y1, and z1. x1, y1, z1 satisfy an equation. Therefore, x2, y2, z2 will also satisfy an equation. What equation do they satisfy? Not exactly the same. Not exactly the same. Let's be careful, yes? The factor becomes 8. Right, so let's see. You just write it down. Let's look at it. x1 becomes 2 times x2. And so on. Each of them becomes 2 times the other, the next variable. Cancel of 4 on the left. Cancel of 4 on the right. And you have 2 times 2 times 2. On the right, you have an 8. Look at that equation. What can you say now about x2, y2, and z2? Yes? They are all even. Absolutely. And then you write them as 2 times x3, 2 times y3, 2 times z3. That's how you represent three even numbers. And then x3, y3, z3 will satisfy likewise an equation. What is the equation that they will satisfy? Yes? Absolutely. The 8 becomes a 16. And then they are all even again because the right-hand side is even. And the only way the left-hand side is even is when they are all even. Absolutely. Now we can keep going. Let's summarize. Let's summarize what we figured out. Start with the solution of this equation. Start with the solution. All three numbers have to be even. Start with the solution in positive integers. Positive integers. They all have to be even. Now, the x1, y1, z1 also have to be even. Oh, even. All right. Now they give rise to x2, y2, z2. We figured out x2, y2, z2 also have to be even. And so on, you keep going. Let's say you obtain xn, yn, and zn. These are not just three random numbers that you obtain, but they satisfy an equation. What equation do they satisfy? Yes? A factor 2 to the n plus 1. Because initially you start with a factor 2, and then it grows one on each step. Absolutely, they satisfy that equation. The right-hand side is manifestly divisible by 4. The only way the left-hand side is divisible by 4 is when, in fact, all three of them are even. So again, they are all even, and you keep going. Now, look what happened. You started with the solution. You started with the solution. Then you obtain some other three numbers. They satisfy some other equation. Then you obtain another three numbers. They satisfy some other equation. And you keep going. You keep obtaining a triple of numbers which satisfy their own equation. What can you conclude from here? Let's wait a little more. Some more people to figure it out. What can you say from here? Starting with the solution, you get x1, y1, z1, and then another tri triple, another triple, and you keep going. Infinite. So the process will be infinite, right? If I start with the solution, we can just keep going. There is nothing that stops you. The moment you obtain xn, yn, and zn, they must be even because they satisfy that equation. And if you look at it mod 4, they must be even. So you keep going. This will be an infinite process. Absolutely, yes. The process will be infinite. Is there anything strange about this infinite process? Yes? Absolutely. Look, we start with x1, with x. It gives rise to x1, which is half of it, so it's smaller. x1 gives you x2, which is, again, half of it, again, smaller. Gives you x3 and so on. You always get an xn. And from xn, you always find xn plus 1. You're always able to find the next one, xn plus 1. So you keep going. As you say, this is an infinite process. And in this infinite process, you only get positive integers. You divide by 2, positive integer again. You divide by 2 again, a positive integer. But what about such a sequence? Can you have an infinite sequence, starting at a positive integer, and decreasing? an infinite decreasing sequence of positive integers, starting somewhere, getting smaller, 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 infinitely many times, just keep going forever. Is that possible? No. 
Absolutely. This is not possible. This is a contradiction. This is a way to get the contradiction. If you start with a solution, it gives rise to another solution of another equation. Then this gives rise to yet another solution of another equation. And so on and so on and so on. You'll be generating so many solutions and they will be decreasing. You cannot have so many. You cannot have an infinite decreasing sequence of positive integers. This is called Fermat's method of infinite descent. To prove that you don't have a solution, suppose you have a solution, and then you find a smaller solution, in this case to, an, to a different equation, and then again a smaller solution, and so on. Thank you. Tomorrow, tomorrow, if you stop by tomorrow, in this equation we replace the 2 by a 3, and it becomes a completely different story. So thank you for your attention.